Hello everybody and welcome back to the channel. Today I'm reviewing Rock Bottom by Robert Wyatt, which is going to be the first of, of many vinyl record reviews. You can think of this as episode one of the vinyl series, I guess. Here it is. Today we're really talking about one of my personal favourite albums of all time. Probably like top 50, top 100 kind of material here. A reproduction of the, the 1974 classic Classic's Rock Bottom. So, a bit of context for you before I launch into the review. Robert Wyatt, he used to be in the band Soft Machine, who were a, a prog rock band from the 60s and 70s. They started out as like almost a psych band, and then on their third album, Third, they inc incorporated quite a few jazz influences, and that's definitely Soft Machine's best album in my opinion, and really um, a cornerstone of the, I guess, the Canterbury scene, and prog rock music in general. Um, and I think one of the reasons why it was such, it, or it is such a great album still to this day, is the influence of Robert Wyatt on the, the compositions and the songwriting, as well as providing some really technical and intricate and expressive drumming. Because of course people forget that Robert Wyatt was a great drummer up until the mid-70s. I'll go into why he stopped being a great drummer in a later part of the video, but for now yeah, we're just focusing on Robert Wyatt's influence on the third Soft Machine album. And one, one reason I think as to why I dislike, or not dislike, but I don't like the fourth Soft Machine album quite as much, is because there's less of a presence of Robert Wyatt. I think he keeps a lot more to the drum set and doesn't offer uh, his wonderful quirky approach to composition to many of the songs here. I think that's what made the third album so great is is the quirkiness, especially on the track Moon in June. That's a key Robert Wyatt piece, I would say, in, in really trying to understand his approach to music. And there was no, there was no Moon in June on the fourth record. There was, there was not even a, an instance of his voice, uh, which I think was a great shame. But, I mean, it wasn't all bad, because it did instill Robert Wyatt to take on a solo career, because um, he was like, well, me and the band, see, we don't see things eye to eye. Like, I want to make these songs, and Soft Machine don't want them. So what I'm going to do is create a uh, a different band. And he, he, I think he formed a band called Matching Mole. Correct me if I'm wrong, but um, Matching Mole is a pun off of Machine Mole, which means Soft Machine in French. So he basically formed a band, uh, taking the piss out of Soft Machine a little bit, because he was like, well, if you don't want my ideas, I'll make my own band. Who does? You can, you can see his, you know, his creative vision and his artistic leadership coming through here. Um, but yeah, Machine Mole, I think I only released one record. Uh, and then soon after that, Robert Wyatt just was like, OK, I'm going to do my own solo stuff. And debuted with a record called End of an Ear in 19... Oh, actually, wait, no, Robert Wyatt, yeah, End of an Ear came while he was still in Soft Machine. That's it, yeah. So he started releasing solo material while still in the band Soft Machine, uh, but he could tell, I think, that he wanted to move in a different direction, and he had excess creative ideas that weren't being realised by that band. So yeah, there's quite a few strands to Robert Wyatt's... quite a few strings, I should say, to his bow. He's not just a member of Soft Machine. Um, but yeah, back to my main point. Robert Wyatt was um, setting his sights on a second record, a sophomore album um, to follow up End of an Ear and he began writing the arrangements with a band in mind he, he sort of composed these songs or these skeletons of songs that would later be Sea Song and then um, Alifib from the the Rock Bottom album um, but yeah he set about composing these tracks with the with the band in mind and he was going to have a rehearsal with this band I believe he was he was he was planning the first rehearsal then tragedy struck and he actually he had an accident where he fell from his his quite high building and, and ended up paralyzing himself from the legs down or something which is terrible it's awful um but uh, it meant that uh, plans were halted in the rehearsal regard similarly wyatt had planned to play drums in this group uh, uh but obviously that wasn't going to happen anymore now that he'd had this accident and paralyzed himself from the legs down he, he realised he'd have to sing, he'd have to record more, and there didn't need to be a set group to perform these, 
compositions, what would be more important is the compositions themselves, which can then, I guess, have musicians brought in to play them as and when needed. But yeah, that's a hell of a lot of context to give you. I'm so sorry. Um, I'm probably going to put a timestamp in the in the comments below saying, skip to 55 minutes in when you want a natural review of the album and don't just want me waffling on about context. But before I do so, I would like to just say one more thing, and that is to do with the cover of the album, which you might not be able to see all too clearly here. But essentially what it is, is a it's a beach scene, and there's some... Looks like some children playing in the in the water there, having a great time. Uh, but what's what's interesting is that the the lower third is highly more intricate than the upper two thirds, and the upper two thirds is what you see most of the time. Like when you're at the beach, you're like, oh yeah, that's the scene. What you don't see is this this beautiful intricate drawing of the underneath of the ocean. And I think that's a metaphor. He's saying that rock bottom. The rock bottom of the ocean can in many ways be the place of inspiration. Um, it can be the place of beauty and aesthetic. In many ways, hitting rock bottom is a chance for rebirth. And it's a chance to really see the beauty of the world in a different light and appreciate things. And that's so poetic because it's exactly the situation that Robert Wyatt found himself in, or I imagine he found himself in with the, the newfound loss of his legs. He must have realised at a certain point that, yeah, losing your legs must have been, must have been terrible, but then also it gives you a newfound appreciation for what you do have, I imagine. And I just think it's, it's, it's lovely. It really is a lovely sentiment and you, you can translate that to areas of your own life and, and whatever, but it, it really is, Rock Bottom really is an album with a story and when you listen to the music, it's like every note seems to be a lot more potent because of that story. And I think that really helps with albums in general. Like, I, I favour albums with a bit of a story myself. I think it, it really colours the music in ways that instrumentation can only do so far. Yeah, it's beautiful. Really, really nice cover. Like, at first it kind of just looks like a pencil drawing. You, you don't really... It's quite unassuming. It's not... <laughs> You know, um, in the court of the Crimson King, it's not a big face going. Ah. It's 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 understated, and you have to really look at it. I think and it reads. You know, verse yourself in the context to really get the full picture. But anyway, let's move on to the instrumentation of Rock Bottom by Robert Wyatt. In a lot of these compositions, there's there's six tracks in all. They're quite long. They're like five to seven minutes each. Um, but in each of the songs there seems to be this lovely built-up tapestry of synthetic sounds. I say synthetic sounds, I mean synth sounds. Like keyboards. Robert Wyatt would uh, record a keyboard line and then overdub himself playing a different keyboard line and overdub again with a uh, maybe more of a, a pad sound that would fill out the chords. And it's, it's, it's a beautiful, like often the textures are really quite lovely sounding. They're lush, they're rich and they're they make me think of the sea a little bit, and it's, it's really strange as to why that is, because I can't pinpoint exactly what it is about the synths that make me think of the sea, but, but they do. Um, and I think that's what perhaps attracted Wyatt to them in the first place. So I think it does say that he conceived a lot of this music um, in Venice, which is... Um... Yeah, the music began to emerge in Venice during the winter of 1972 on the tiny island of Giudecca in a huge old house overlooking the lagoon. So yeah, there's a water theme here. The synths, they do have a watery sound to them. Case in point of the, the lushness of the synths, check out track three, whose name is Little Red Riding Hood, Hit the Road. That song um, always, it takes me, it just, it just hits me. It's like a ton of bricks, the, the beauty of that texture. I was just kind of sit there just nodding along for the first minute or so, just like, I'm just, I'm just floating, man, like that, that texture is so, so wonderful. Um, and yeah, it's just simply created on layered synths. It's just a wonderful sound, and, and that really does predicate a lot of the record. There's plenty of times where there's just a drone. There's a lot of drones on this album, but they're all so lovely, and it's very easy to get lost in them. Um, but 
aside from the synths, there's a lot of nice bass work on this album. Like there's there's two bass players who Wyatt kind of interchanges on the tracks. There's Robert Sinclair, whose work I'm not very well versed with, and then Hugh Hopper, who I know a little better. He's like a a great English jazz bass player who played on Soft Machines records as well. It's fantastic. He always holds it down to the point where if he wasn't there, the music would fall apart, I think. Um, and he provides some lovely bass on this record. And then the drummer, who um, only features on two of the tracks. So one third of this album has like a drum kit on it, which is interesting. Because obviously Robert Wyatt himself is a drummer, so you might think, oh, a lot of the, the, you know, he'd be great at writing drum parts and therefore there'd be drums on all the songs. But no, only on two of them which is a slight mystery. Maybe he was slightly salty about not being able to play and, and did, <laughs> didn't want to ha have the drums as too much of a feature. I don't know. I'm only speculating. But the fact that the drums only appear on two songs, it's one on each side, um, side of vinyl. I think it, yeah, they're quite hard hitting when they do arrive. Um, and it, it just it just adds some weight and some punch at necessary moments on the album. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a lady called... Laurie Allen, who plays the drums on this album, um, and she has a great style. Like it's really, um, it is hard hitting when it needs to be. Like there's real instances of just a well placed flam on the tom, or or something that just really cuts through the mix. But it's also quite flowing. The style, like it doesn't seem to hit on one, two, three, four very often, and in, <clears throat> in the classic jazz way, kind of avoids these numbers and instead syncopates and weaves around. So there's a combination of that weaving and that flowing, while also having that hard hitting kind of um, every so often a moment of real high dynamic. And yeah, like, yeah, it's good. It's very nice. It's very satisfying. It's almost like waves crashing on the beach. Like they, they flow, but they're also very destructive. Yeah, it's good stuff. So yeah, that's the instrumentation in a nutshell. I'd also like to talk a little bit about the lyrics too. There's some really funny lyrics on here, like just silly lyrics. Like I think on the first song, Sea Song, which is a highlight for me, Wyatt seems to, I think he talks about his partner and, and says that she's partly fish, partly porpoise, partly baby sperm whale. Is that supposed to be a compliment? I don't, I don't know, but um, he, he basically likens her to those three things. When you're drunk, I like you most at night. You're quite all right. But I can't stand to see the different you in the morning when the time comes for being human for a while. You just like that. That's such a such a, an English problem, you know, liking someone when they're a bit pissed, um, and then in the morning when you have to play it being human again, you kind of a bit like, do I really like you though? Do I? So he combines these two: these the ridiculous, the metaphorical, with the very, the very UK English sort of down to earth kind of lyrics. It's what makes him great, I think. I put down here. There's a. There's a quote from the Italian music critic Piero Scaruffi, where he says that the the lyrics and indeed the music of Rock Bottom sort of combines, you, you can't tell whether it's an intense religious hymn or a childish nursery rhyme. And the drawing together of these two things is what makes it, um, what's well, an unlikely pairing to begin with, but it's an unlikely pairing that, that really does work. and. I think that's what makes that's that's what some of the the charm I think of Robert Wyatt is is he's able to 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 bring together something that's nonsensical and something that has a great deal of meaning and to combine them in a way that is powerful but not necessarily in any discernible way like I'm not like I don't listen to a song of Robert Wyatt and go oh yeah I know what he's talking about there but it's powerful nonetheless and that's what makes this album so so special, I think. That's what makes that album so special to me. Yeah, we'll leave it there. In terms of the chords used, there's a great combination of these these really deft, sort of complex chord progressions, and then also just more of a, a pedal point, like, and that is a single bass note that stays the same while the chords change on top of it, but um, the harmonic bass note doesn't change. Just from the very onset of this album there's this beautiful chord progression right at the start of the first track C song whenever I put this album on it just kind of floors me I just kind of sit back and just think yeah that is it just such a mystical chord progression it, and it's played so beautifully it always gets me 
But once you've listened to Sea Song, I don't think there's any way you could not want to listen to the rest of the songs. Um, a Last Straw has a great modal chord progression to it. It goes between two chords. And it's that going between of two chords, almost like a, an alternating current that creates the energy and creates the, yeah, the tension. And that's not even to speak of the, the B side, which has just three more great songs on it. I'd say the A side is definitely better. Uh, it's more consistent. But the B-side still has wonderful moments on it. Like, I love Alifib and Alifi, the contrast between those two tracks. Uh, Alifib is just this, this breathy, fragile, wonderful counterpoint of synths and bass and voice over the top of it, and even some breathing sounds. And it just makes it sound like it's alive, like the piece is breathing. And then Alifi brings in a lot more primal, raw energy to it. And it has, it has these wonderful bass clarinet and... And I think it's Barry Sachs, or it might be Tenor Sachs, solos over the top, played by the wonderful Gary Window, uh, which just adds, yeah, like I said, primal sense to the song, and is the counterpart to the, the flowy beauty of Alifib. So yeah, that's pretty damn good. That's pretty damn solid music in general. The final song's quite strange. It's definitely not one of my favourites on the album, but it certainly has its place, and I do quite enjoy the outro, which <laughs> just features this, I think his name's Ivor Cutler, this Scottish spoken word poet, who comes in and over the top of this accordion, it sounds like, and just sings, or speaks rather, a strange poem. Um, I'm not going to try and imitate it, because I think you'll probably listen to it and get get the sense of it yourself, but um, <clears throat> it just comes out of nowhere, like four minutes in, suddenly... Ivor just rides in with his accordion and just starts singing um, about weird, um, weird shit. Um, but it's great. It is wonderful. But like I say, it's not necessarily a highlight for me. But by the time I'm at that point in the record, I'm kind of like, yeah, Mr. Wyatt, you deserve this. You deserve like a bit of experimentation and, and weirdness. Like you've had me on the edge of my seat for the, the first five songs. Um, I might as well. Might as well listen to the final one, hey? But yeah, that's Robert Wyatt's Rock Bottom in a in quite a lengthy review. I definitely don't want to do such a long review for each of these albums. Certainly not um, in my vinyl collection. But uh, but yeah, this is one of my favourites. Just the story behind the album, the cover art, the the instrumentation, the musicians, and of course the composition by Robert Wyatt and his voice and everything. Uh, it just comes together. It really does come together. This is an album, you know what I mean? It's not a collection of songs. It's it's a record. It deserves to be listened to on a format of disc, big disc. And for that reason, I'm giving this one a 10 out of 10. Because I, yeah, I think it deserves it. Like, there's plenty of albums that that hit harder or give me more pleasure. But they're not necessarily better albums, I think. Like, when it comes to album, kind of, uh, album criteria, this is definitely top of the mark. Top of the mark? Top of the class. Mark. Mark one. Mark my words. This is a 10 out of 10 record. Believe it or not. Robert White. Rock bottom. Yeah, see, see you next time, time when I review something, something else. else.